To explore the differences between the two types of coals, one of Marler's students, now Professor Mark Konishi, devised an elaborate experiment that relied heavily on the sharp hearing of an owl. Peter Marler hypothesized that uh, uh, small songbirds produce two types of alarm calls. One type is very difficult to localize, the other type uh, is easy to localize. And I thought uh, I could uh, 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 test that hypothesis experimentally. And this is the setup to test that theory. Mark Anishi placed a grid of loudspeakers over the floor of a dark room. The owl, trained to attack the sounds coming from the speakers, sat at the other end of the room and flew from its perch to its target when calls were played from one of the speakers. Konishi shifted the sound of the call from speaker to speaker so that its source appeared to move. An owl's hearing is so accurate and its reaction so quick, it can even change course in mid-flight if it can locate the source of the sound. This is a, a star owl. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Oh, don't bite me. This is a barn owl named Roger. Barn owls don't usually attack small birds, but Roger has been trained to attack the sound of their calls. His accuracy depends on how well he can locate them. Stand there, stand there, okay? Once in the room, the lights are turned off and the experiment begins. A series of infrared photographs shows how accurate Roger's dive bombing is when he can tell clearly where the sound is coming from. He's less good when the sounds are hard to locate. So Kanishi can tell what sort of sounds Roger finds tough to spot and what sort of sound he locates easily. The results indicate that uh, sounds like pure tones like this type of sound is very uh, difficult for an owl to localize. On the other hand, noises like this type of sound is very easy. Comparing the two sorts of calls recorded by Marler with the sounds used by Kanishi and Roger shows how similar they are. So the bird's alarm calls are perfectly designed for their roles in drawing attention to danger, pure tones discreetly, sharp checks with bravado. These calls and the language a songbird uses to converse exclusively with its own species, its song, are often accompanied by some visual display as well. A flicking of the tail, a craning of the neck, and in the red-winged blackbird, the raising of its distinctive red epaulets. This gives the bird two ways of getting its message across, two channels of communication. Is one more important than the other? Certainly, appearance matters for the red-winged blackbird. It has a habit of attacking anything with red epaulets. Even an old sock. Doug Smith wanted to find out if it's the song or the epaulets that matter more in territorial defense. His first plan was to disguise the epaulets to see if song alone was enough. But to do that, he had to find a way to catch enough birds quickly and safely and to know what territories they'd come from. Knowing how quickly a red wing responds to an intruding bird, Smith invaded red wing territories with an intruder of his own, safely tucked away in a cage. On top of the cage, he fixed a cloth mouse trap. quietly waited.
By being able to trap just the bird he wants, Smith can quickly disguise its red epaulets. Since the bird molts in winter, its red wings will be back untarnished next season. As a control for the experiment, he dabbed the wings of some birds with a colorless fluid. This was to check that it wasn't just the handling of the birds that was affecting their behavior. Then he let each bird go, back on its own territory. See that? There was another male that had come onto this uh, territory in about the 15 minutes that we had that male off. And uh, that male was in fact acting territorial. He felt that that territory was his. And when we released this uh, resident male that we just caught here, that new male that came in attacked him. That just uh, shows you how quickly a territory can be taken over by another male. The resident red wing, now a black wing, goes straight back to defending its territory against the intruder. Singing loudly, craning its head high in the air, and displaying its now very undistinguished epaulets. The intruder seems scarcely to notice the presence of this odd new black wing species. The black epauletted males had a great deal of trouble maintaining territories. And in fact, 50% of them lost territories whereas only 3% of the control males, or the normal males, lost territories. So that it really did make an, a, a tremendous effect on their communication. So, if the red epaulets play such an important role in maintaining territory, what of the famous Conqueree song? Doesn't it matter after all? At least in guarding its property. The obvious way to find out was to reverse the wing blackening experiment, this time leaving the wing display alone and altering the song. Smith operated on a group of birds, so they no longer sang their normal conqueree. As before, he then released the birds to see how they defended their territory. I found that, uh, that males delivering these atypical songs uh, had 100% uh, success in maintaining territories. They, diff they didn't differ at all from the normal vocalization males in their ability to uh, hold and maintain territories. Which seemed a very odd result. Songs didn't seem to matter at all in helping red-winged blackbirds guard their territory. And it didn't even seem to be important in getting and keeping mates. Birds with altered songs got along just fine. But Smith repeated his experiments next year. Now things didn't seem so simple. Now, that was uh, seemed like a very pat story to me. Uh, because this is, uh, I've been working on this for two years. This year, however, I found that males that deliver these atypical songs do have a high probability of losing territories, although right now my numbers are quite small and I can't say this for sure. But it appears that if there is a, a great deal of competition for territories, if there are lots of males around competing, that in fact, males that sing these atypical songs are at a disadvantage. It may be that males that live in upland-type habitats, that's one which has trees and uh, bushes as opposed to marshes, may have to rely much more on sound than vision in order to advertise their presence. The idea that the relative importance of sight and sound depends on the bird's environment echoed an experiment done several years earlier by Bill Dilger. In upstate New York, the same dense woodlands harbor five different thrush species. The olive-back thrush, the great cheek thrush, the hermit thrush, the veery, and the wood thrush. While they look similar, they sing very different songs. So what I did was to present to territorial males of each of the species uh, visible models of all of the other species. And for this I used uh, not stuffed birds which aren't very durable in the wild and the rain and the wind and the attacks of irate territory holders and so on. This is a paper mache model of a wood thrush. We use paper mache models because of their 
durability in the field. Dilger took his hand-painted models and set them up near thrush nests. No matter what model he used, the resident thrush always reacted as if it was an intruder of its own species. Wood thrushes attacked veery models. Veeries attacked olive backs. In fact, all the species attacked all the models. So it didn't seem that the visible uh, stimuli of, these, of each of the species was very important in species discrimination. Of course, that left uh, vocalizations. And that's rather easy to do. One can get tape recordings, good ones, of all of the species, various vocalizations that they make, and play them back on all of the territories. This time the results were very different. I found that uh, immediately that wood thrushes attack anything that seems to uh, be producing wood thrush sound, and veeries attack uh, in response to very vocalizations, and all of the others similarly, but none of them showed interest in vocalizations of uh, any other species but their own. So it's quite clear that the vocalizations were exceedingly important in this group of thrushes. Like the upland red-winged blackbirds in Doug Smith's experiment, Dilger's thrushes relied more on song than on plumage displays for territorial recognition. Too few species have been studied for any general rules to be made, but it does seem that birds living in the wide open spaces use sight more than sound to spot their own kind. For birds who inhabit forests, where they can't see very far, the role that song plays seems to become much more important. In fact, some birds who live in very dense forests have developed extremely elaborate songs, sometimes just so individuals can keep in touch with each other. These are jay thrushes, found wild in the Himalayas. And what sounds like one single song is in fact a complex duet performed by both birds. The females of most songbird species don't normally sing, but in jay thrushes, the song is shared between the male and female partners of a lifelong pair bond. And they sing together. Fred Wenzel, a graduate student of Doug Smith's, devised a way to discover which bird sings what. To do this, I devised a method of stereophonic recording in which I placed a microphone on either side of an opaque partition and the birds uh, were not quite accustomed to being separated so I provided a window in which they could see each other and this proved to be sufficient for them to sing together. And the two microphones of course were hooked up to a stereophonic recording system in which I could then make stereophonic tapes and separate the parts. That's the song sung by both birds. The separated parts show how each bird sings practically every other note. And the fit between the notes sung by each is so tight they even overlap a little. Different pairs devise different songs so that each bird of a pair can keep track of its partner. The full complexity of the duet only really becomes clear to humans when the song is slowed down. Watch the birds trade off, singing every other note. 